We're delighted to have you with us this evening. This is our second live event as part of the Safar Film Festival, which we called a sonic road trip. For those of you that are not familiar with Safar, uh, the film festival showcases and celebrates the diversity of the broad range of talent, both emerging and established from across the Arab world and the diaspora. And this year marks our fifth edition. And whilst COVID-19 has meant that hosting the festival in person was impossible, uh, we have, through the support of the BFI COVID-19 Relief Fund and the League of Arab Ambassadors, we've taken the festival online, we've built a brand new website, and we made the program entirely free so that everyone can join us uh, on a journey into the best of Arab cinema. Uh, if you enjoyed tonight's event, all we ask is that you consider paying it forward by making a donation of at least £10, which is effectively the cost of a cinema ticket. Um, we'll add details of, um, of, our, of our website in the chat just in a bit. Uh, your support at any level will help make our ambitions for Safar 2021 a reality. A donation of 10 pounds, for example, could pay for a young person to attend a screening at next year's festival. And a donation of 25 pounds could pay for an emerging filmmaker to attend a workshop led by an industry leader supporting the development of the next generation of talent. If you have already donated, and I know a lot of you have, thank you so much for supporting our program and helping us to champion Arab cinema. And if you'd like to find out more about the wider work of the Arab British Center, or if you're interested in continuing your support through any other way, uh, please do drop me an email. We'll share my contact information in the chat in just a bit, and I'd love to hear from you. Also, just so you know, we will be making an announcement about our plans for a Safar 2021 um, during our closing event on Sunday night. So make sure you sign up for this event and all the other ones. We have one event every night until Sunday. So check out our website, safarfilmfestival.co.uk and make sure you register for that. Um, tonight, we're delighted to be joined by Rabiel Khoury, who's this year's Safar Film Festival curator and Vatshe Burhurjian, whose film Tramontane is available to watch for free on the Safar website until Sunday. We're also joined by Eran Aid, who's the sound designer, and Cynthia Zavin, who composed the music for the film. Uh, I'm just gonna give you a very quick introduction on Rebir, and then I'll let him introduce our guest, and then we'll get started with tonight's conversation. So, Rabir is the Managing Director at the Metropolis Association, which manages Metropolis Art Cinema, the only art house cinema in Lebanon. And since 2006, he has also worked as General Coordinator for Beirut Cinema Days, the Arab Film Festival at Beirut DC, a cultural association uh, promoting Arab cinema in Lebanon. He has organized over 20 Arab film weeks in the Arab world and in Europe. And now he joins the Safad family as the festival's fourth curator. And it has been truly such a pleasure working with him these past few months. And um, especially given the challenges that we face, we've been through a roller coaster of decision making and <laughs> uh, big question marks along the way. So we couldn't have had this with we couldn't think of having it with anyone other than you Rabia so thank you and um that's it for me I'm gonna leave it to Rabia now and I hope you enjoy this evening's conversation thank you Amani uh thank you everyone it's really nice to see people joining this talk um uh, I'm very delighted to present to you tonight's uh talk um I would like to to state that we chose this film before the recent events that happened in Beirut. Uh, we were in conversation with the distributor back in late July, early August, which was really, really before the explosion that rocked Beirut on the 4th of August. Um, and I would like to say that we're extremely delighted and thankful for uh, Vache, uh, Cynthia and Rana who are taking the time to join us tonight in these very difficult times that Lebanon is going through. And I would like to thank you for just taking the time to be with us, but also try to think about a film that the three of you did some years ago and which we're discovering uh, in a complete different light in light of the events that are happening. On a personal note, I don't know about the three of you, this talk might be slightly emotional. So we will ask all of you to bear with us. Um, uh, 
uh, but at the same time, it's the film is an incredible journey uh, of this uh, young guy, Rabia, who goes on to uh, retrieve his identity. And what we plan to do with you tonight is also take you on a journey through this country in all of its shapes and forms. It's like a, it's like a, how do you call it? This, uh, this fox that changes uh, outfits every night. This country is like that. So we will try to embark you on a journey with us. Um, but before we do that, I would like to introduce you to our, to our speakers tonight. First, we have Vache Bourgourgian, who's the fantastic director of Tramontane. Um, Vache is a Lebanese filmmaker. He holds an MFA from the New York uh, University's graduate film program. Vache has made a short film called The Fifth Column, which uh, received a production grant from the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, premiered at the Cannes Film Festival at the Cine Fondation, where it won the third prize. And Tramontagne also premiered at the Cannes Film Festival at the Semaine de la Critique, being the first Lebanese film to premiere at the Semaine de la Critique and then embarked on a worldwide journey uh, where it won prestigious awards and attended several festivals. Alongside Vache is Cynthia Zavren, who's a composer, she's a pianist, she's an artist, she performs classical, experimental, improvised music, you name it. Uh, she made um, shows as a solo artist, but also collaborated with, uh, with numerous artists. Um, she, the speciality of Cynthia is that she really explores the relationship between sound, memory, and identity uh, through the narratives that she uh, works with. Um, uh, she did her own installations and shows, but also she worked a lot on with filmmakers. She uh, really composed uh, several film scores with acclaimed filmmakers from Lebanon and the Arab world, uh, namely Hassan Salhab, uh, Maes Darwaze, Simon Haber, uh, Fuad al Khouri, and of course with on Bache's uh, Tramontagne. And next to Cynthia is also Rana Aid, who's, uh, who's uh, now becoming a star, <laughs> uh, whose film, who, one of her latest films for which she composed the sound design is a film called Honeyland. You might have seen it, a documentary from Macedonia. The film was nominated to the Academy Awards in the foreign language uh, category, uh, or as it is called the international uh, film, uh, but also as uh, best documentary. Rana has uh, composed, this, uh, has created soundscapes for numerous Lebanese and Arab films. Um, she also has been vividly supportive of uh, young emerging talents in the Arab world uh, and Lebanon. And Rana also is a filmmaker herself. She has directed uh, the documentary film uh, Panoptic a couple of years ago. So very warm welcome to all three of you. Thank you so much for joining us. We're very delighted to have you and we hopefully can kick this talk off. Thank you, Rabia. And thank, thank you, Rabia. And thank you to the Arab British Center as well as the Sefer mm -hmm. Film Festival and Joey at Sharp Teeth Films for making this possible. Thanks so much for having us. Uh, I would like to start by, as we said, that this, this film is a journey. It fits to our theme this year of Safa. We went with the concept of journey. So we, uh, when I was thinking about potential journeys, I thought, yeah, well, we have to talk about uh, Rabia's journey, who's this blind young musician who goes through the country to retrieve his identity. Um, Lebanon is a country that has a very complex geographical, social, political, economical, uh, you name it, firework, if we want to call it. Um, and Tramontan is really a film about all these hardships that Rabia goes through on all kinds of level. Um, we saw the film some years ago as a film that addresses Rabia's identity, but now when we, when we think about the film today and in lights of all the things that the country has been going through this year in particular, it looks like a film about collective identity in a way. I would like to ask the three of you if you see this film as speaking to the collective Lebanese identity, uh, but also what do you believe identity is today for the three of you? How do you feel identity uh, shaped you in the last year in Lebanon? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are, are you start? sure the talk is 45 minutes? <laughs> 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 
Well, who wants to start? You go ahead. Well, you Rana, go. you want to say something? Okay, stop that. <laughs> well, look, I mean, I just want to say something um, about starting this film, this project to begin with. When I began, I began this about, I began writing this, you know, film about eight years ago, uh, the very first draft, and I was, it was coming from a place of very deep disillusionment. Uh, so, I was questioning everything, I was doubting everything, and uh, primarily because uh, I was seeing a new generation of Lebanese who had never seen the war, had never experienced it, but were extremely belligerent. And, um, and you had uh, different factions, and history is not taught here, by the way, in case, for those of you who don't know, uh, officially, history is not taught in schools the, of Lebanon. The history, of the, war. The, the history of the war is not taught here. The recent history since 1975 is not taught here in schools here, which is arguably the most formative period in modern Lebanese history, right? So uh, having said that, the, uh, each faction uh, from each sect, so to speak, from the war um, or sect in Lebanon actually was then left to uh, to come up with their own explanations of the war and their own histories of the war and sort of perpetuating this uh, animosity that existed between different factions. So instead of uniting after the war, it was the country is, was atomizing even more. And, and each sect, each faction was more and more entrenched in their own wartime positions. So War had ended, yes, in 1990, the violence had ended, um, but the war had not really ended, you know, for all intents and purposes. It had still, it was still going on. It was, it took a different form. It just took a different shape. So, uh, so there were multiple different identities at the same time inside Lebanon, all very entrenched, all in positions of animosity with one another. And uh, this was extremely frustrating for me. So I wanted to uh, make a film that addressed this very issue uh, where someone who literally can't see his past has only heard stories about this brutal experience, this brutal collective experience uh, is uh, going through this journey trying to find who he is and in the process discovers a country that is extremely fragmented, that has um, told lies to each other as well as to themselves and, um, and it is up to him to discern what the truth about himself at least could be. So to answer your question, I mean Lebanon uh, encapsulates multiple different identities in my view and this is uh, sort of an unfortunate result of the war uh, and no one, I mean the government officially there has been no attempt to actually mend this, mend these differences. On the contrary, there's been an, <laughs> there's been an active effort to, to foster an, an, this atomization, to nurture it officially, because uh, this serves the, the, the leadership in power now. So this is the, the tragedy that we are living through right now. And although there is, yes, collective, there are collective experiences that would live together that have marked us as being part of oneness, but there is incredible difficulties between uh, each of these identities. But what unites everybody is this uh, trauma. Yes, and the trauma. The last that's trauma, the only thing that actually... Well, this last blast in Beirut was the, the, the biggest trauma. We never lived such a thing, even during the 15 years of war, we never felt this. So this was like the, the cherry on the cake, you know, we had the economical problem, we had the financial problem, we had the, the, the COVID, and now this blast. So it's like, what, what is next? What's coming next? You know, it's, uh, and it's difficult to find yourself as, uh, 
just a human being who just wants to live. You know, you don't belong to a particular community or a religious sect or um, or a, a political leader, and you're just someone who just wants, wants to, to stay clear-minded to be able to uh, to see what's what's right and wrong, and uh, and it's becoming more difficult by the day because you're bombarded with information um, uh, you, and also social media doesn't help obviously so if you want to criticize a little bit if you want to have self-criticism or, or if you want to question if you want to doubt uh, suddenly you're it's on the wrong track or you are a minority so what happens to you if you are a minority how can you live how can you go on do you have to align yourself with a certain power, with a certain military power or religious power or a certain community uh, to feel protected. And this is how we have lived until now. But if we don't want that, how would it be possible to live in a country like Lebanon? I think that's the main question. We're still trying to find that out. It's very hard. I have no idea what's going to happen in the next uh, few days. <laughs> yeah, sure. Later today. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I don't know. What, what yeah, do you yeah, have we'll to be. say about it? Uh, I was thinking a lot about when we first talked about this um, talk uh, that uh, we have a problem right now. I think I am uh, thinking about the big picture. I think in, uh, since Sykes-Picot and the drawing of the map of Sykes-Picot uh, and the creation of the State of Israel, I think they wanted a space with lack of identities so they can do troubles and they can do proxy wars so i think the um, the epiphany i had that we are a group with lack of identities and we are trapped in this in this uh, little bubble that is somehow a country a chaos but it's very interesting and we love it but we are like a group with lack of identities, with lack, lack of individuals, and uh, with no memories. So it's, um, you know, layers and layers and layers of removing our soul and our capacity of, uh, of being alive. So that's why there's a huge like sentence that uh, the people of Beirut don't die because they, are, they have resilience and they, ha they don't die anymore. They are zombies, they are undead. So we don't die, we cannot die, we are already dead. So I think, um, because now we're hearing a lot the end of Lebanon, the end of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of this uh, beautiful space. So we're hearing the end of it because now they need another playground. They need another kind of uh, torture with individuals, you know? So I think this is, this is very interesting for me trying to understand why did they do this? Why did they do this to us on a, on a like a social level? On a, what's the experiment well, uh, actually, uh, beyond all this? So that's... Um, I would actually just uh, look at it in a slightly different way too. Um, because uh, I would think of it like, for example, the, the people who are in power now have been in power for the last 50 years, right? I mean, but and they come from families, established families. And uh, these families were given prominence by the Ottomans for 400 years. They created a system which was designed specifically to stay fragmented so that they could rule. That was, that was like, mm -hmm. like their, yeah, their, uh, their whole uh, strategy of ruling this, uh, this region. So uh, they, gave, they completely fragmented the power structure here and that stayed. And then when the French came after 400 years of that kind of slow, uh, like uh, structuring, very careful structuring of a power system within this uh, small land of Lebanon, the, the French come and uh, pretend to redesign it. And, um, and then that stays as a so-called independent state. But we're still feeling that uh, the, the repercussions of, of that power structure, this feudal system that has existed for so long and that can't be undone from one day to the next. So suddenly you have like people who are loyal to 
uh, to their leaders, their local leaders, their feudal leaders, and not to the state. So, and these feudal lords, uh, in the absence of a Turkish, French, or Syrian overlord, suddenly are looking, each one is looking at a different foreign power to provide them uh, support and legitimacy and, so, money. and money. And so suddenly you have uh, like seven or eight different like countries battling inside Lebanon. So this is, and uh, this literally creates a, a schizophrenic uh, identity uh, mm -hmm. or I mean, because there's, and, and I mean, there's, it's, it's no doubt then that, that you have like such a problematic state, such a fragmented, such a, uh, you know, such an implosion happening right now. So it's, uh, it's really tragic. And it's, uh, it's just sad that people can't see this for what it is as well. I mean, I mean, this is just one theory. Obviously there is many theories, yeah. but, um, but we're trying, you know, there is a revolution yeah, we're, going on. We're trying. We're trying. <laughs> I mean, when you don't have partisans within the revolution, at least you know that people are trying to express something. And uh, we can only hope, but we know that the, um, the puppeteers are, are doing their job from outside. Well. So... Um, I, I would like to go on this point, Cynthia, because I think this is very interesting. If we look at um, the film in, in regards to everything that you just mentioned, also Rabia as a character is someone who has been trying uh, to face the system and retrieve his identity and uh, do his own thing, his own way, the way he um, made, I mean, he pushed himself to do this. Um, I wanted to talk about, I mean, you mentioned these things, but you made this film years ago, Vache, um, and you also mentioned all of the things that now are taking place, but these things also have been taking place before. Do you see the film today in a complete different context? Uh, do you feel it's, it, um, uh, it evolved with the situation that is happening today? Could, let's say, you could, if you make the film today, do you think it's, yeah, and, and I totally understand. I mean, I do agree with you, Rabia. I mean, uh, look, I, I, I see this film now in a, in a different light. Well, maybe when I made it, I was feeling uh, very obviously depressed and very helpless and frustrated at the situation here. Um, and I, but now somehow, I don't want to say I'm vindic I feel vindicated, but like it's uh, it's become like uh, it's crystallized for me more. Why like uh, the, why I made this film? So, so I mean, in um, in the story, something in Rabia's past comes back and haunts him, right? And something he doesn't know about. So so this thing comes back and haunts him from his past and shatters his reality altogether. Well, now something from our past has come to haunt us and very literally shattered our reality. This is what happened to, like literally to us now. And I mean, if this can be a wake up call for us, what can? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the capital is totally destroyed I and mean, so many lives are lost or completely disfigured. So, um, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's a, uh, yes, I mean, there is a new sort of relevance for me now when I, when I look back, making, having made this film. But, um, and Hisham is part and, of Yeah, Hisham, I mean, the uncle uh, represents part of an older or, order, of course. And um, in this case, Rabia is not like one of these young militant types who, uh, who, who just pledge allegiance to their local lord. Uh, he's one who literally has to look for the truth. There's a very pragmatic reason for that, of course. That's why he's uh, compelled to do that. But, um, but also, uh, uh, so, uh, so he, he, and he eventually does. But like a lot of Lebanese at the time, I mean, until now, actually, until now, uh, they end up dealing with the problem just by... Um, acquiescing somehow, so adapting, because they're not murderers, they're not criminals of any kind, 
uh, the, I'm talking about citizens here. Uh, and uh, they find a way to adapt, just like, uh, just like Rabia did in the film. He finds a way to adapt and move on with his life. And that's the reality here. That has been the reality. And till today, it's the reality. I mean, after the blast, people were left to their own devices to fix their homes, to clean their streets, to pay for everything. So, this, I mean, in the absence of a state, uh, but they are suffering the results, the outcomes of the state's actions and the state's decisions and policy making. So this is, uh, I find, incredibly unjust to the people here, to us. I mean, uh, I mean that's just one of the injustices that we've suffered in, the, in just the past month. But, uh, but it's been accumulating for decades. I mean, literally for decades, for the past 50 years, it's been accumulating. You know, so this is, uh, it's just heartbreaking, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wish I didn't have to make this film. <laughs> I wish, uh, you know, I wish this wasn't the reality that we had to experience now. But it is, and here we are. And I, and, but I hope that the people will finally, like, embrace the idea of trying to learn uh, history, their own history, in a more lucid, exhaustive, unified way, rather than this very narrow-minded approaches to how to live, be a citizen in the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, I don't know, this might, might uh, sorry, I'm, I'm talking like, this may not make much sense to people who were not from here, but uh, as I apologize in advance for that. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions later too, of course, <laughs> to clarify. Um, Bache, I would like to go with you and also with um, Rana and Cynthia. This talk, ideally, we conceived it to look at the, this character that you created, Rabia, who's a blind uh, musician and who's blind also in real life. Um, it's also much more difficult. I mean, for all of us who see the, the country is already very difficult. So I would only imagine what goes in the mind of this blind guy who in a film has to retrieve his identity. Uh, I was really interested to talk to you and to, the, to Rana and uh, Cynthia about the writing of this film and taking into consideration that this actor is a blind guy in real life. How do we conceive a sonic score around uh, this person. Um, he has to witness so much, but he cannot see anything. At the same time, he is a musician, so he has a particular sensitivity as well. While writing the film, how much were you involved with making a sonic shape in your mind? Uh, and when did uh, uh, Cynthia and Rana come in uh, to support you or to give input on the actual script before you do anything else? Mm -hmm. uh, do you guys want to comment on anything before I jump in? No, it's good to move to the film. Uh, okay. We go to the cinema side. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yes, I mean, the, the, the sound was a very prominent part of the film from the script stage. Um, of course, I knew Cynthia at the time, and uh, she's been involved from the script stage from the very early stages. Uh, I met Rana later, um, but she read the script pretty early on as well. Uh, now, um, I think that the script evolved in a lot of ways after having met, uh, during casting. Uh, because uh, I, I, as I was casting, I realized that, um, first of all, let me just say one thing. Uh, when I was writing the film, I, was, I had a very important ethical question because I, I felt like I always wanted to cast a, a real-life blind actor, okay? And, uh, but there was an ethical issue with this because I didn't know uh, what it meant uh, for a blind person to be in a film but never to see that film. So um, once I started casting, I soon realized that uh, all... Uh, everyone I met, every blind person I met, was actually actually enjoyed films uh, or television because uh, they would follow the story. And so it was all based on hearing. And uh, that went also for Barakat. He loved the idea of being in a film. So that soon dispelled my, uh, my fear of uh, 
casting a real life blind actor. So, um, so having done, having settled that, I moved on to we we moved on to working with him with Barakat, and there were a lot of little details that we picked up while working while working with him and uh, being around him. Frankly, for example, we drive to his village in the north of Lebanon, which is uh, two or three hours away from here in Sparta, and um, along the way, he would know exactly where he is by the sound that the car would make on the road, you know? So let's say um, you know, we'd be around a bend or in a certain village and he would, he would say the name of the village and Cynthia would ask, how do you know that? Uh, and he'd say, there's a broken water pipe here and every time the car passes, it makes this splashing noise, very specific splashing noise, you know? So he knew exactly where he was uh, at each step of the way. And so sound was an extremely important part of, um, of the film, obviously. Um, but, uh, and also because, uh, you know, we were talking about, of course, the sound, the concept of the sound, how um, it will, he's heard stories, he's never experienced them, etc. So for him, really, the world is divided into two. The world of the, the sound that as we experience it in everyday life where we hear people in dialogue etc um where as it turns out most of it is lies and he has to discern and analyze what is the truth and on the other hand he has the world of music which is uh, someplace where he feels secure it's beyond the realm of uh, truth and falsehood it's someplace where it is is safe harbor, so to speak. And so there, there are these two worlds in which he inhabits. Uh, so having said this, uh, we approached the, um, the sound design and the soundtrack in a very organic way. Uh, after shooting, during shooting and after shooting, uh, we, we, Rana, Cynthia and I would always discuss uh, certain things uh, and Rana introduced me to an incredible sound engineer and sound recorder. His name is Cedric Kayam. He, um, and he recorded every sound on site. So, and she wanted this specifically to be the case. She wanted all the sounds to be from each of the locations that we went because we shot on real locations. And uh, by the time we were done and we went into Rana's studio, uh, she had something like a hundred tracks of sound. 190. Um, was it 190? <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So it was, it was an incredible, like an encyclopedic sound, uh, like the texture was incredible. Um, so it was, uh, and then we went into the studio and we started like trying to really, uh, you know, find the sounds that would make thematic sense within each given scene. And then uh, you guys worked in a different way, uh, I mean, to meld the sound and the music. And you guys can probably talk more about that. Yeah. And but, but sorry, Cynthia, before, before you talk about that, because I want to, I'm very interested in your collaboration with Rana as well, because I think this is something that really uh, worked very well. But I wanted to ask Rana first, because Vache was mentioning all the sounds that were recorded on set. Um, how did you conceive uh, 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 a sonic score for uh, for this blind person. How much were you involved as a sound designer without uh, having Vache uh, telling you we would like to have this? Or what was your research like on a project like this? This for me would be uh, interesting to know because you asked Cedric that you have to do this and that. How did you approach this project? Uh, in every project, when I have the luxury to do that, I uh, always talk to the sound recorders beforehand, before he goes to the shooting, to talk a little bit, how, what do I need and what's the ambiences, what the specific sounds that I need. So I said intuitively that I said, Cedric, take all the details. The ambience are very important, but take all the details, like the props. I need to hear all the props and the instruments he's using but uh, in a way, not the nota or the harmonics uh, of, the, of, the, of the instrument, but, but the sound of the body of the instrument. 
so um, uh, the, it, it, it was the first idea I had and then we enhanced it a lot with, uh, with Vache and, and, and with Cynthia that it's, um, with, I didn't want to go, you know, usually when you have a blind uh, person on screen, you have a lot of sounds. So you are emerged with sound. What, uh, what I was trying to do, and then Vache went really, we went really beyond because we removed all the ambiences at some point and uh, it was like removing ambiences uh, on the opposite of putting more ambiences. So we had like these, it was 200 tracks, but I had it, I hide them from Vache. <laughs> 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 we're trying to remove sounds after sound but for me it was like the specifics the details the little presence of every little object because he's he's uh, this is the identity for him he's trying to find the identity so every single detail is very important to to Barakir, uh, to Rabia in the film so uh, uh, it wasn't like doing design and doing impression or sensation. It was really finding for objects that we don't pay attention to in the real uh, life or we don't pay attention to their sounds, especially the little sounds of the violin or the any instrument. So the box, you know, the resident box of, the, of an instrument. So, uh, and then uh, when Cynthia will, uh, will talk a bit and then the merging between the sound and the music to have a whole soundtrack. We don't know where the music is, where the sound is on. And I think for me, it was the best thing I had in my life because working with a director, musician and sound as a, as, as a team, really a team, not, you know, competition of egos. <laughs> so. Like an organic sort of creation. Yeah so to speak. It was like one thing that yeah. emerged yeah. from collaboration. But then I would like to go to Cynthia because I think we're talking about, uh, in the end, we're talking about the musician. Uh, so the, the film has music without you being involved. But then there is a score that you composed um, for the film. How did you manage to, to find this balance be between the music of the musician and the music that you wanted to... Uh, to conceive um, for the film, and then we can talk about your collaboration with Rana. So, um, in the very beginning, um, the earlier drafts of the script, that you had a Western choir. So the singer would be singing Western songs, because we do have a lot of choirs in Lebanon that, uh, that sing Western music. Um, and then when we met Baraka during casting, uh, it felt very uh, natural to just replace the Western music with the traditional Arabic music that uh, you hear in the film. Because he's, he's really an amazing musician himself. He plays 11 instruments. And uh, it was fascinating to work with him, really one of the best experiences ever. Uh, and obviously he has perfect pitch. So he memorized the entire script already because uh, Vache had uh, transcribed it into Braille, so he just memorized it entirely. So he was, he was a, just an incredible, uh, an, yeah, an yeah. incredible encounter uh, and so beautiful you, musician. Yeah. So when he came into the set and when, he, uh, when his part was created, basically, because then you had Arabic music, and then uh, we saw that he could also improvise on the violin. Um, so suddenly there were all these scenes that were being added to the original script. And I thought if I bring in an orchestra, it's going to be really heavy because we already have a lot of music, a lot of diegetic music that is being sung and played. Uh, so I wanted to stay very minimal in my composition. And that's why you only hear uh, one clarinet, you hear piano, uh, it's quite minimal and it's like the spirit of the entire film to keep it minimal but uh, more importantly I think the whole soundtrack was basically actually the film was uh, a balancing act between the composed music and the diegetic music and the sound design. between the composed music and the sound design uh, between the light and the darkness 
Mm -hmm. And also when it, in regards of the uh, work with the sound design, uh, we wanted to blur the edges so that you wouldn't realize when the soundtrack ended and when the sound design began or when the sound design ended and when the music actually started. Uh, so that the evolution of the soundtrack would be perceived by a blind person, you know, and would understand the whole story. Yeah, that's uh, actually a very important point because that's something that we forget because during uh, when the three of us were just begun began talking about this project um, eventually and we knew that Barakat and his friends enjoyed films the whole soundtrack including the sound design evolved into something we wanted to make it something that would be understandable without seeing a single shot in the film mm. yeah and uh, that was made uh, during the mix during the final mix uh, so oh, that Rana yeah. had all the ingredients, the incredible ingredients were ready and the mix is when you actually, you're, you're cooking. Uh, so we have all the ingredients and we're trying to adjust which sound comes from the back, what comes from the front. How, how are we going to create this sonic universe around this character to embark the audience on a journey of sound and music? So. We can't hear you. Uh, I think it's also fascinating because there are many parts in the film where you feel like there is a marriage between sound and music. When you speak with many sound designers and score composers, basically they're always at uh, war edges, you know, because they feel like the music is going to take over the sound design or... Uh, but uh, in Tramontane in particular, I remember there is the scene with the steps. And I really couldn't tell if these steps, for instance, were designed as a music or just designed as a sound. I couldn't really tell. And this I found fascinating, like, you know, just hearing steps. I could, like, how am I, how are these steps resonating with me? So I wanted to ask you, um, Rana or Cynthia, how was it to work together in such a, I mean, you had to do things basically together, each on, on, on her own, but then bringing them together. How was it to collaborate so tightly to do uh, sound and music together? Well, no. we, had, go ahead. Go ahead. we had like uh, every few days, like meetings, like the usual meeting with the director. And so, and some, many, many times Cynthia comes. So we have like uh, together the, what Cynthia did and what I did. But the, I remember something, I don't know if Ache and Cynthia remembers, there's a sound element in the film, the chimes and the, at the door. And uh, when, uh, when Rabia is moving around the house. And so I put the sound, Cynthia came and we talked and really at some point I didn't know, did I did this sound or Cynthia did it or Vache removed something. So it was so, such a collaboration that really during the process, it was so smooth that it wasn't me, her, or it was like we put elements. This is what I, I, I remember all those very long evening we spent at the studio and putting things and trying and removing and merging. So it was uh, the, 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 the most important thing of this experience is that we had a lot of fun and it's a very serious film and we were laughing. And this is very important when you have fun during a very making a very serious film. Exactly. So, yeah. Because we actually were very excited about the little discoveries we make Mm -hmm. and the links that we would create between different yeah. sounds mm -hmm. and between in this different universe, how thematically that would make sense, how it would make sense for Rabia as a character. So these discoveries were so much fun. Mm -hmm. This creative process was so like, you know, it just, was, uh, Yeah, and uh, uh, once we realized that uh, the final concert, uh, one instrument w was not really, <laughs> wasn't recorded properly. So we thought, okay, we have to bring back but I can't, then we have to record in the studio. Yeah, Larana, open the studio. It was, I don't know what time. And then he came oh, yeah. and we had to record it, but then we had to sync it with the image. And I think we stayed till 3 a.m. Yes. And then the next like, day we had to send it to the festival. Yes. It was complete. Uh, like literally would stay up until 2 or 3 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This like is filmmaking. Frequent. I think it's normal. <laughs> Um, you know, it's normal when you enjoy it in this case you know it's, but it's the thing is we worked many times Rana and I on different films but this was the first time 
that we worked on a film that required so much collaboration between sound and music because the main character is a musician and he's literally guided by sound. So talking about that scene with the footsteps, you hear a piano and it's going uh, with off the beat, sound off yeah. beat with the footsteps. And uh, it was really creating this dialogue between, between, uh, between sound and music. And with Rana, sounds are musical. Mm. You know, and in my music, I always use some sounds. So you don't know if it's a real instrument or if it's the string that's being pulled because I play prepared piano. So it doesn't really sound like a piano. So wh where's the sound and where's the instrument? You know, where's the sound design and where's the composition? It's, it was just this uh, beautiful collaboration. Yeah, very good. But also just yeah. like- Terrible just a, friend, by no, the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's fine. <laughs> no, but just to, also just in that one part, again, just to, you know, just to point out like a very sort of moment that we were very excited about and had fun doing was in creating this moment of poetry that uh, we thought was poetry. It was, for example, having the footsteps, the piano beneath it, and then his breath over it, mm -hmm. as well as the wind. So all these elements were mixing very sort of organically together. Mm -hmm. And it was just a beautiful moment of uh, yeah. creating yeah. that and experiencing that. Yeah. Uh, before I, uh, bef you can start asking questions if you wish, uh, but I have one final question myself, which I would like to ask Cynthia. Um, there is a very long piece at the end that closes the film. And uh, I, I'm very curious about this piece because it feels like it sums up his journey in a way. Uh, it's a reflection on his whole journey that he's been through. Uh, uh, finding his identity or not. Um, it looks like also a reflection on the future of the country today, I feel. I mean, we started this talk about this film by talking about the country, but I think this, this piece at the end really says a lot about the country today. Did you, was it your decision? Was it Vache's decision to have a long piece that closes the film? I mean, in the end, uh, you are the person who maybe made decisions on some tracks. So can you tell us a bit about how this long piece came together to close the film? Uh, from the start, uh, from the first draft, the film ended with the big concert. So the concert existed. But uh, the, then the choice of the songs came at a later stage. And you're right. I mean, the song, yes, it's very relevant. We do need answers. We want answers. There are so many things that we don't know. Um, to me, the film opens with the main character walking through a dark bedroom out to the garden to perform. And the film ends with the same song that he performed at the very beginning, but this time he's performing on stage in front of an audience. So it felt like it's a rite of passage from boyhood to adulthood in a way. And uh, throughout, this journey, he learns how to be independent. He learns uh, maybe not to trust people, to trust his own instinct and just to do whatever he wants to do anyway, which is to travel and be a musician. Well, he is a musician to play with his band, to perform with his band. And that's his identity. He is a musician. Um, why is it long? Well, originally this song can go on forever. It's uh, it's called, it's a specific musical genre that's called Kudut Harabiya, and it was developed in the late 19th century in Aleppo, Syria, but the melodies existed since the 7th century from Andalusia. So these are melodies that have traveled all across the Arab world, from Baghdad, even to Turkey, uh, to Cairo, to North Africa, to south of Spain. And the only thing that unites us in this Arab world is the language and the music. Otherwise, we're entirely divided. So I didn't want to choose a Lebanese song that would confine him in a specific territory um, because the identity is much broader. You know, we're talking about something that is very rooted and uh, a traditional classical song that has traveled across centuries 
and across all the Arab world is really a very solid background that he has. So he is carrying history with him. He is a carrier of uh, an, a knowledge that is above the, the usual regular uh, citizen. Uh, but he still is looking for answers because may, he might know something that is uh, more erudite, let's say, but, uh, but as a musician, but as a citizen, he wants answers. As a victim, he wants answers. Well, I think, uh, may, may I add something? Yes, of course. Uh, can I, if, if I may? I want to get a glass of water. Okay. Um, look, this is the, the entire film. And uh, culminates to this point. It was a very conscious choice to make this the way it is. And it was quite contentious, actually. Originally, now it stands at six and a half minutes, I think, and um, the, the, the concert scene. But uh, when Barakat performed it, originally before editing it, it was 16 minutes. Uh, Even and, longer. Yeah, it, was, it could have been, it. there were some takes that were 18 minutes. Mm. So it was quite long and uh, we took it down first to 12 minutes, then 10 minutes, then eight minutes, then finally we settled on, uh, we found an edit at six and a half. And even that seemed wrong for, for everyone. But for me, it was very important to have this final scene on Barakat because as I said, the film culminates to this point. His entire journey is building up to this. And here he has the stage for once, um, you see that he does, it doesn't matter um, whether, what, what sect he belongs to, his, his nationality even, his identity doesn't matter, and uh, not even his name matters. It's only him and his talent, you know, so who he really is. So I wanted to present him as, as Rabia as bare as he, like mm. in the most transparent way possible. This is who he is on stage. And I, and I want to put, you know, put the audience with the audience uh, of the auditorium present right there, as I do throughout the film in many scenes where the audience is with the, uh, you know, placed within, within a certain scene, seated at a table or, you know, on a divan with the sheikh, etc. In this case, with the audience literally uh, in, uh, partaking in this, uh, in this, uh, uh, in this, yeah, in this moment. Now, I mean, there is, there is something uncomfortable about it, I, I admit. I mean, and this is something that someone had pointed out. It's like the punk attitude that, uh, which I did intentionally, which is to say that um, it implicates the audience in some, in some way by placing them in the audience, because he's directly addressing the audience too. So, but it is also, in my view, it could also be a moment where we can rejoice in his minor victory. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, Vache, I have to take a couple of questions. I think we have limited time. There is a question from, uh, uh, pop, 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 from uh, Jenny. Um, Jenny is stating that your name is Armenian and there's an echo in the story of what happened to some Armenian children during the 1915 slaughter and the uh, dispossession of all Armenians. Was this echo in your mind at all? Um, you know, uh, maybe subconsciously. <laughs> I don't know. I, I really don't know because subconsciously it could have been in my mind because I have heard countless stories from my family, from every Armenian's family who, from Lebanon or from the diaspora, stories where children have been adopted uh, without knowing who their real parents were, etc. Um, so yes, I mean, somewhere, somewhere in Rabia's character, there's a bit of me too, obviously. I mean, and my history. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, I can talk about it. My grandparents were from Anatolia. My parents were born here. I was born in Kuwait, you know, <laughs> so I'm from all over. Uh, and there isn't like a linear history that I can say I can identify with. Um, it's a very fragmented history and personal history due to the fragmented history of the region. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there is a bit of that history inside the story too. It's, it's become part of the DNA of, mm -hmm. 
of my films, I guess, of my writing. Which brings us to another question from Yassim, who has who says that it was great to to see to screen Tramontan in 2017 in London and then in Dhaka in 2018, and the audience was very moved. And he thanks everyone who contributed. And his question is, if you have another project that you're cooking at this stage. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, thank you for the comment too. I'm so happy that it was shown in Dhaka and in London too. Thank you for that comment. And, uh, and yes, I am working on several projects as, uh, actually, but uh, working on it, writing, you know, so I'm between me and my computer and my papers, because right now making a film in Lebanon is close to impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, so unfortunately. unfortunately, yes, that's part of the recent reality. Uh, so, but, um, but you know what, I can always invent stories. That's the beauty of being a writer of filmmaking in some way. I mean, I couldn't just invent it and just have it on paper. So uh, whether sometime in the future, hopefully get made, but all of them, but all of them also deal with these similar experiences dealing with um, history and identity and etc. Very different from uh, trauma team. There is, uh, there are two similar questions who come, who came up. Um, there is a question from Alan who says, has Lebanon ever had a truth and, re uh, and reconciliation process like Northern Ireland and South Africa? I ask as the final song seems to imply forgiveness is essential and forgetting perhaps necessary. And there is also a question from Alia uh, who says, I wonder if the secrecy and lies surrounding the civil war in Lebanon portrayed in the film really reflect the reality in Lebanon now. Following the explosion now, are there calls for reconciliation? So basically the topic of reconciliation, I see Rana laughing. <laughs> uh, yes, you answer. I don't, I, I, I'm not sure because uh, we have, you know, the, the war ended in uh, the 90s after the, um, the general amnesia or amnesty. So uh, we want to reconciliate with something you can remember. And, uh, and uh, we, we, we don't know the history. We don't, uh, we didn't talk about it. We never talk about it. So I don't think... Uh, I'm going to have a very, very p pessimistic view and I think a lot of people will hate me after what I'm saying now that uh, it wasn't big enough, the explosion wasn't big enough so for us to understand that it needs to stop and we need to end this madness. I think it's, it wasn't big enough. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it's like, uh, that's one of the tragedies because even after such an explosion, even after the, uh, the capital was totally destroyed, people are still adhering to their local lords. Exactly. This, is, this is completely incomprehensible. So there was no, the, just to answer the question, there was no truth and reconciliation effort like in Northern Ireland or South Africa uh, uh, here. There was general amnesty here. And for the warlords, for the warlords who, power. who became the, the new leaders of the country. So literally what they were doing during the war continued as, a, as them just, you know, uh, swapping their, uh, their fatigues for suits, basically, mm -hmm. and suddenly becoming uh, politicians instead of warlords. Yeah. In, and they basically continued the way they were doing business during the war without the violence, but sometimes with violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Vache, can I uh, ask you as a last uh, as a last question? We're going to take to comment about the title of the film. Ahmad is asking you why is the film called Tramontan? Uh, well, the term, <laughs> the, in English it's Tramontan, in Arabic it's Rabia, right? Um, now uh, it was uh, Tramontan has uh, many layered meanings in, in English. I um, I came across it and I was, I felt like it, it would make sense in this, in this film because it means from, literally, it, uh, it means from the other side of a mountain, it also means the other, it also means a barbarian, uh, and it's also the name of a wind, uh, and, and it's also referred to in, in French as someone who has lost their bearings, um, so someone who is lost. Uh, so, 
uh, I felt like it made a lot of thematic sense to use this as a title, uh, especially someone who is um, wrongly perceived as, uh, as an enemy, from the enemy. Um, so that's the uh, Western title, but uh, the Arabic title, I couldn't find the equivalent of Tramontan, but uh, I felt like his name uh, was already meaningful enough. So uh, I called it Rabia because uh, Rabia means spring in Arabic. And um, in this case, he's re literally reinventing himself. It's a, it's a process of reinventing rediscovery. So that's how the titles came about. And with that, I would like to thank you for uh, sharing thoughts with us um, about this film, which today we're seeing in a complete different light. Um, I really thank you for taking the time to be with us in this talk. Um, I know this is not an easy process at the moment, but thank you for being able to open up to us to share your thoughts about this film some years later and in lights of the recent year that has been happening in Lebanon. Um, Vache, uh, Cynthia, and Rana, we wish you also all the luck with your upcoming projects. Um, and hopefully you can, as Vache said, still reinvent yourselves in light of everything that has been happening in the country. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rabia. Thank you. Thank you.